So we're going to talk about neurologic disorders and non-degenerative spinal disorders. So again, my favorite quote, and I'll harp on it every day that you're in clinic if you want to come visit, you see what you look for and you find what you know. If you're not aware that these disorders occur, you'll never think about them. You won't know what to do. So first one is quite common, unfortunately, neuropathic pain. It's pain generation without current nerve or tissue injury. So you have chronic pain signals delivered like that doorbell with a short circuit, and yet there's no tissue damage. You don't have a flaming hot foot. You don't have a leg that's in a vice, but you have leg pain. So this occurs because the nerve itself can become crushed or stretched. And the injury can be a crush, a stretch, inflammation, or even a vascular injury to the nerve. We talked about earlier vascular injuries. What was that disorder? Peripheral neuropathy, right? That's a vascular disorder. You typically don't have as much pain as you do with a nerve crush injury, but you can. So a leaky nerve membrane is responsible or a sodium potassium pump failure. You remember the nerve membrane opens, this little ball valve comes out, you can pass uh, electrolytes through here, calcium, potassium, sodium. But if this ball valve is injured and cannot close, and you have a leaky nerve membrane, and your potential goes from negative 70 millivolts to 55 millivolts, what happens? No, action potential. Boom. So you get a triggering of the nerve. So you get an ectopic focus. The nerve sends this pain signal. And then it repolarizes a little bit. And then, unfortunately, it continues to leak. And boom, another pain signal. This is ectopic focusing. And this creates injury to the nerve. And what you have is burning pain, constriction, allodynia, and hyperalgesia. So people that have this chronic pain will talk about a balled up sock under their foot or somebody with a compression stocking that just won't quit. You can have allodynia, that's painful touch. When you touch somebody's skin, that should be a light touch receptor, but it's interpreted by the brain as pain. So if you light touch somebody and that's pain, that's typically from a nerve injury. And hyperalgesia, they have much greater pain than you'd expect. If you put a deep pressure on their, on their part, they won't, they won't let you touch them. Sort of if you have ever seen an RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy patient, it's something similar to that. So retroperitoneal disorders can refer pain to the spine. Why? Because they're supplied by similar nerves as the ones found in the lumbar spine. And if they're retroperitoneal, L1 through S1 are going to supply the same organelles as the vertebra. So you have to be careful because it goes through the same tracts as the somatic sensory system. So if you've got a pancreatitis that can look like an L1 or an L2 vertebral problem. So quality and timing of the pain can identify what structure is affected. We're not in a differential diagnosis class for kidney disorders. But some things, for example, if you've got a problem in the lower pelvis that's painful radiating into the back that occurs once every 28 days. I mean, it's probably not going to be a lumbar spine, right? It's probably going to be a uterus or something like that. You have something called the chandelier sign. If you do an exam on a patient and they reach for the chandelier and pull themselves up off the table, that's normally a pelvic inflammatory disease. So we're not going to go through each one of these, but there are differentials that you can read about. So what are the organelles that cause these? It is sad pucker. I, when I was in medical school, I had to force all this knowledge, and I forgot about it until I re-reviewed this. And sad pucker are these organelles. I won't have you spend the time, but all of these can refer into the lower back. So there's referral and cyclical patterns. I guess we are going to spend a little time on that. Kidneys are unilateral costal vertebral pain. Okay, I didn't think, I thought I'd remove this slide. 
So endometriosis and ovarian cyst, cyclical pelvic pain. PID is not cyclical, as I said, the hanging chandelier, chandelier sign. Ectopic pregnancy is a surgical emergency. Good history needed. Seven weeks after the last period, prior pelvic inflammatory disease. Why? Because unfortunately it scars the uh, fallopian tubes. Diverticulitis can be steady abdominal pain. Cancer, of course, and gallbladder right-sided pain after fatty meals. But that's all we'll say, I hope, unless my next slide tells me. Okay. So when you're doing the history and physical examination, you look for neurologic disorders, upper motor neuron lesion symptoms. So if you've got a cord problem or a brain problem, you're going to have imbalance. You're going to have paresthesias in a non-dermatomal pattern, right? So you understand the difference. You have an L5 radiculopathy, radiate down the buttocks, posterior thigh, to the top of the foot. What if they have buttocks posterior thigh radiating to the medial knee and then lateral foot? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Doesn't fit, and you have to start thinking other things. Upper motor, oh, I forgot, I'm sorry here. Lermitzan, as we talked about, lightning type pain down the arms and legs. Normally when you bring your head backward, but can occur when you flex too. A feeling of disconnection. My leg doesn't feel right. That can be proprioception a very large part of the nervous system. So if they t walk around and they say, God, my leg just feels heavy, weak, it just doesn't feel right, do the examination. How do you test for proprioception? Position, yeah. So just grab their toe, and we'll, again, we'll see on the, on the video, and pull it in directions while they're not looking and see if they can recognize it. So signs, these are things that you find on exam. Hyperreflexia, obviously. Release signs, like a Hoffman sign. Everybody knows Hoffman's, right? So you take the finger. They have to have a hand that's totally relaxed. You take their middle finger and you flick the nail, and you're looking for a contraction. So that's a release sign. Incoordination. There are tests that you'll see in the physical exam video how to look for incoordination. Paresthesias, as I said, you're looking for paresthesias by using a pinwheel. Clonus, which is an alternating contraction relaxation of the foot. And as I said, Hoffman's. Lower motor neuron lesion symptoms. So if the nerve itself, but not the central nervous system, is compressed, typical pain, paresthesias, and weakness. Everything that everybody expects in a nerve problem. Signs of lower motor neuron weakness reflex deficit, sensory loss, okay? Sensation is increased. Allodyne and hyperalgesia, what do you think about things like that? That doesn't fit with a typical nerve injury unless it's a chronic nerve injury. Most people who come in have dull sensation, have paresthesias, pins and needles. They don't have allodyne and hyperalgesia. So be careful when you see those. You're looking for motor strength, reflexes, and endurance and fatigue. And again, we have a whole bunch more to come, so I won't belabor this point. So specific disorders, myelopathy. Look at the size of that herniation. Look at the cord signal change. Something going on here. There's compression of the spinal cord, normally in the cervical spine. In coordination, loss of upper extremity fine motor skills. What questions do you want to ask them? Can you zipper a zipper? Can you pick a dime up off a table? How is your handwriting? Can you put a key in a lock? Can you button a button? Think about the questions you would normally ask them. And then remember, you find what you know, you see what you look for. Ask those questions. If they say, oh, I can button a button, I can zip my zipper, then maybe you go on a different tact. So you have causes in coordination, loss of upper fine extremity motor skills, non-dermatomal paresthesias, Lermitz signs, spasticity, and abnormal gait. So how do you test the gait? Heel to toe walk, don't let them look at their feet. Can they balance themselves? Okay, they're, they're not out in the middle of the night with three beers under them and the cop having them walk the white line. Can they do that test? Hopefully they're sober when you see them, of course. Long track signs, again, hyperreflexia, clonus, Hoffman's, adiadocokinesis, remember that? 
quick, quick motions and try and alternate, make sure that they're coordinated. And then the triangle test, which we'll go through if I can get this to line up. We've lost it. Oh, there it is. The triangle test, which has to do with leg coordination. So multiple sclerosis. It is an autoimmune disease, antibodies against oligodendrocytes, CNS, myelin sheath, conduction loss. So what kind of signs are you going to see in MS? Central nervous system. Long track signs, right? And the typical things that you would see with myelopathy, in coordination problems with balance, fine motor skills. But there's a little difference. Number one, females outweigh males two to one. Onset 20 to 40 years old. Most common in light-skinned Northern Europeans. Seriously, if somebody comes in who's blonde and blue-eyed, I'm thinking more MS than I'm thinking myelopathy until I prove otherwise. Unilateral vision loss doesn't fit. Diplopia doesn't fit. Paresthesias of upper and lower extremities. But this is associated with fatigue, dizziness, and incoordination. There are a number of different ways it can present. What you'll find is upper motor neuron findings, motor blocks, sensory disturbances, long track signs, and visual changes. So when you start to see these things, you got to start to think, is this MS? What other things can cause it? Now, polio. Unfortunately, with the anti-vaxxers nowadays, this was a dead disease years ago. With anti-vaxxers, and I hope nobody's an anti-vaxxer here, then because this is a problem, because we're starting to see these diseases recur. If you were around when, you, when I was six and seven, Polio was a true disease process. Salk vaccine just came out, and it changed everything dramatically. I, can sh I have pictures in another talk of hundreds of ventilators that kids were in because polio damaged the phrenic nerve, and they couldn't breathe. And they'd hopefully recur from this. You can see she's got genorecurvatum. So vaccine confers immunity, but we're starting to see this. Diaphragmatic paralysis can be fatal. Paralysis of muscles associated with anterior horn cell damage. This virus attacks the anterior horns. Somewhat similar to Lou Gehrig's disease. We'll talk about that. Tabes dorsalis, unfortunately, is coming back because of Grindr and YouTube. It is true. It is what's happening now. We're starting to see sexually transmitted diseases are becoming more and more common and people are not looking for this. This is secondary syphilis, where you get the red spots in the hands. It's from a spirochete. It's a sexually transmitted disease. It's normally cured when the first symptoms are noticed, but if you don't cure it the first time, you get secondary and tertiary forms that may not be treated. And the tertiary form is associated with damage to the posterior columns, or gracile and cuneate tracts, so they lose proprioception. So they walk with a drunken gait. So if you see somebody without long track signs, but they have walking of a drunken gait, you have to start to think outside the box. Syphilis is coming back, unfortunately. So ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. This is an interesting autoimmune disease. We think of only the peripheral motor nerve cell destruction. So it's only peripheral nerves but bulbar too, meaning peripheral nerves in the head and neck and body. It's not sensory. So if somebody's got paresthesias and numbness, doesn't fit, right? They have loss of strength, weakness, clumsiness are the initial symptoms. The muscles will exhibit fasciculations. Very important because there are plenty of other disorders that cause fasciculations. But again, if you see it once, you'll know it. Once you see the fasciculations, you start thinking, could this be ALS? Starts after the age of 40, and the disease advance leads to loss of speaking, swallowing, and breathing. Median survival from diagnosis to death, a year and a half. But interestingly enough, Stephen Hawking had this disease process and lived to the age of 70, but he had plenty of money for respirators and nurses. And I'm not sure about the nurse situation. We won't go there. Okay. Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's occurs 1% over the age of 60. You'll see tremor, muscle rigidity, 
bradykinesia, so the muscles get weaker with use, and akinesia, no muscle strength. So it's loss of normal autonomic movements. So these people have what are called mass-like faces. You meet them, you can't forget them. They're sort of dull and flat. They're relatively expressionless. And they may, at advanced diseases, start drooling. They have a fascinating gait called a festination gait. So they can't move their muscles fast enough. When they move, their legs move slowly, but their arms move less and they start to get to the point where they want to fall over. And so watch when you first do a gait exam, that if they don't swing their arms, that's the first sign of Parkinson's. Not necessarily that they have it, but what you have to watch out for. Okay, let's see what else. Mask like faces, pill rolling. So two types of tremors, essential tremor, Parkinson's tremor. Essential tremor is when somebody goes to do an action, they start to get worse when they point to something. Parkinson's has a tremor at rest, but when you ask them to do an activity, the tremor disappears until they stop, then it comes back. You'll see videos of this. So interestingly enough, 75% present with unilateral symptoms. You don't have to have it bilaterally. And the rest tremor present, everybody remember, what was it, Catherine Hepburn? And she had that shaky kind of voice. That is not a Parkinson's voice. Voice tremor is, no, if I can get back, voice tremor is not associated. And I talked to you about the festination gait. Charcot-Marie Tooth, we talked about it earlier. It's an inherited disease of peripheral nerves. There's 15 different types. And again, myelin sheaths and nerves are affected. Here's a differential, both motor and sensory. Hallmark is the cavo varus feet, the big arches, turned in foot, Remember the stork leg appearance? They lose their calf muscles, so their legs look like a triangle. 10% have a spinal deformity. Intrinsic muscles of the hand can be involved. You see somebody that has intrinsic atrophy, one of the differentials now you have to start to look for is Charcot-Marie Tooth. Lyme disease. We're seeing more and more of this. An infectious disease from the bite of the deer tick. That's what a deer tick looks like. It's called Borrelia burgdorferi, and it's a spirochete like syphilis. The tick bite to the onset of symptoms is 3 to 32 days. So these are people who could come from West Virginia hiking the Appalachian Trail, get a tick bite there, and now they've, they've been gone from there for two or three weeks, and then they start to get the target lesions. So 80% will experience an erythema migrans. Again, this is what it looks like. And then they, after that, it spreads into a large red ring with central clearing called a target lesion, obviously. They don't all look like this, but they can. You initially get headaches, fevers, chills, and myalgies, and fatigue, just like a regular infection. And late developing, if this is not picked up and they're not treated with normal, I think it used to be tetracycline, I think they're treating it. Anybody know exactly what they're treating it with now? Anyways, I think it used to be tetracyclines. They'll develop frank nerve abnormalities, meningitis, encephalitis, cranial neuritis, Bell's palsy, plexitis, brachial plexus normally, and mononeuritis multiplex, Symbol, single nerves distributed throughout the body. Ulnar nerve here, a brachial nerve here, sciatic nerve here. 8% will develop cardiac manifestations. Oh, here it is, doxycycline and erythromycin. So you got to start thinking about these things. Somebody comes in with weird neurologic abnormalities and that doesn't fit, start to look for other things. Guillain barre syndrome. How many people have had a flu vaccine? Okay, you're all potential victims of Guillain barre syndrome. It occurs probably only one out of every <coughs> 200,000 people, but it's an ascending paralysis and autoimmune phenomenon with myelin destruction occurs days to weeks after a viral prodrome or a flu shot. Starts in the foot and leg weakness and ascends into the spine. Mildest form is simple fatigue. So you can have Guillain-Barre syndrome and have no symptoms from it. Effects normally disappear within months. 15% have long-lasting impairment. Somebody comes in, legs are weak, foot drop, I just feel weird. You have to start to think of this. Herpes zoster. Herpes zoster is chickenpox. So if you've had chickenpox, you have 
this virus sitting in your dorsal root ganglion. What triggers it, we don't know. But unknown stressor, unknown stressors activates the virus. The first symptom is unilateral pain down the nerve domatome looks like a radiculopathy. So you've got to be careful because you get an MRI. If a person comes in and they're miserable pain down their leg and you get an MRI and it's normal, it doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with them. Wait three to four days and you'll see the vesicles and the papules. Rash occurs two to three days later. Small reddened fluid filled blisters. Rash increases for three days and then dries up. This is important. post neuralgia, this affects the nerve. So if they have a, a herpes outbreak like this, shingles, it is very helpful to treat them with steroids because a steroid treatment during the beginning of the attack can reduce nerve scarring. Some people have post neuralgia, chronic nerve pain, and you want to try and treat them before that if you can. Sometimes if they have pain and you don't see the vesicles, then you're sort of stuck not knowing whether you should treat them or not. Parsonage-Turner syndrome normally occurs in the cervical spine, can occur in the lumbar spine rarely. It is a brachial plexopathy. It's an inflammatory plexopathy of the brachial nerves. Can occur, I've seen it twice in the lumbar spine, but very rare. Sudden onset one-sided shoulder pain, severe in crescendos in a day or two, looks like acute radiculopathy. Shoulder paralysis, upper extremity work, weakness more than one mitome. Look at the deltoid muscle here. See the atrophy? This is a guy who had Parsonage Turner placed in the cervical collar. And does he need a cervical collar? Because this is not a radiculopathy. This is an inflammation of the brachial plexus. It can last months to years. Full recovery in 75%, but I have seen patients with deficits after. Male to female ratio, diagnosis made by exclusion. So EMG is a great way to diagnose this, but can you get an answer in the first three weeks? No. What do you need for an EMG to be positive? Wallerian degeneration. Remember that first set of slides? You have to have breakdown of the nerve root and death of the nerve before the EMG is positive. So if you get an EMG in the first three weeks, it will be negative. DISH, as we talked about earlier, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, non-painful associated with degenerative disc disease. But interestingly enough, most of the discs that have these fusions are normal because you fuse the disc before it wears out. So they don't have disc problems. Spurs that start as non-marginal osteophytes, eventually spine stiffens as the spurs coalesce. Is it dangerous? No, not really. It just stiffens you up, so you can't bend forward to touch your toes, but it's not dangerous. Autoimmune vertebral involvement, spondyloarthropathies. So these almost always start with the sacroiliac joint. Exceptions are rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, but all of the other ones start with either unilateral or bilateral SI joint syndrome. Here you can see an MRI. There's a little involvement of that right SI, but look at the left SI joint here, okay? Most our involvement of SI joints are unilateral, but ankylosing spondylitis is bilateral. Almost all of the disorders have eye disorders associated, except for psoriatic arthritis. Common, common complaint for all of them. Stiffness in the morning that gets better with motion and fatigue are indicators. And the exception here is rheumatoid arthritis, and these are rheumatoid, psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, Ryder syndrome, ankylosing spondylitis, and lupus. And we'll start to take apart all this. So here's a sacroiliac joint CT scan, normal on one side, one fused on the other, right? Is this ankylosing spondylitis? No, good, because one side's open. So almost definitively, by looking at this, this is something else. It's one of these problems, but it's not ankylosing spondylitis. If both sides were fused, I would say AS and not the others. Yes, do you have a question? Okay. So this is what ankylosing spondylitis looks like, marginal syndesmophytes. Unlike the dish where you see the parrot beak spurs, this is right on the margin here. So they're seronegative 
meaning there's no blood test to diagnose it, although there are markers, but not a definitive. It's like if you have syphilis and you get a lab test and you have antibodies to spirochetes, you got syphilis. But here, there's something called HLA-B27, which is a blood marker that makes you sensitive to this, but there are people with AS that don't have HLA-B27 and people with HLA-B27 that don't have AS. So you have to start to weed these out. So non-marginal syndesmophytes, these are marginal syndesmophytes. So AS has a bamboo spine. You can see that it sort of looks like a bamboo spine. Ankylosing spondylitis patients fuse their spine together. So if they're not treated while they're in the inflammatory phase, they get this chin-brow index. So this guy can't look up. He is fused down like this. If he was treated while he was undergoing the inflammation, you can get him to fuse upright. But here, this needs a big surgery to correct him. So AS starts with bilateral SI involvement. Incidence is not small. One in a thousand people have this. It's not a small incidence. There's periods of remission and aggravation. Back pain that wakes the patient up at night. Morning stiffness better with motion, very commonly. So you get up in the morning, oh man, it's terrible. I get into a shower, shower hits my back, ah, it starts to feel better. Motion makes me feel better. I like to exercise. So that's a sign because degenerative disc disease, they don't necessarily like to exercise. Loading the spine makes them worse. So patients who are stiff and feel better with exercise, not saying it has to be one of these, but that fits. Start to think about it. Marginal syndesmophytes, bamboo spine, 95% HLA B27. Ankylosing spondylitis, again, you can see the marginal syndesmophytes. The spine is fused together like a bamboo rod here. And the first thing you'll see, other than SI involvement, is you'll see, remember the vertebra are scooped out in front? They start to fill that in. That's one of the first signs, initial squaring of the vertebra and marginal syndesmophytes. So examination, they're gonna start to stiffen their spine. They won't be able to have the excursion of their ribs. So if you measure their chest inspiration, it'll be limited. And if they bend, see this guy's trying to bend forward, he can't bend his lumbar spine, it's fused. And so he's sort of stuck on exam and you can get iritis and you can get conjunctivitis. It's very common with this disease. Rider syndrome, associated with a chlamydia, always these sexually transmitted diseases. But it is chlamydia STD, occasionally with enterocolic infections. The infection ceases and the syndrome begins. Common, urethritis, conjunctivitis, arthritis. Somebody comes in with common chronic bladder problems and their eyes are bugging them and their spine hurts, the first thing you have to think about, Rider syndrome. Commonly in riders, they get heel pain from Achilles tendinosis and SI pain. And you can see, they, I've never seen a patient with sausage digits, but there's plenty in the books. You can see them. Psoriatic arthritis. Skin disease, I think it's 5% of the population. Once they start to get nail bed changes like this, they can get an arthritic change. 25% of these patients develop arthritis. 95 have peripheral arthritis and 5% have spondyl arthropathies. So if you look at the percentage, only one quarter develop arthritis, and of those, only 5% of that quarter have a spondyl arthropathy. So it's rare. But if you see somebody with psoriasis, you've got to start thinking about it. Enteropathic arthritis. Here we see the SI fused. This side is open. This guy is commonly associated with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and irritable bowel. 20, 10 to 20% will develop sacroiliitis. 10% develop spondylitis. Again, non-marginal syndesmophytes, inflammation. You've got to start thinking about it. Ask the questions. Rheumatoid arthritis is destruction of the synovial joints throughout the body. So is the disc a synovial joint? No. So they don't have, they can have degenerative disc disease, but what are the synovial joints in the spine? The what? Facets, and one more. Well, SI is, yeah, I guess that'd be spine. No, then there's three, I'm sorry. 
You're right. What's the other? C12 dens articulation. That's a synovial joint. And that's one of the most important ones because if they start to erode that, they can develop instability. So the joints of the hands come in early and they'll have pain and swelling. It's typically symmetrical, painful subcutaneous nodules, and spinal involvement is almost exclusively cervical. That's important to note. If somebody's got really eroded joints in the lumbar spine but not in the cervical spine, it's not rheumatoid arthritis. So the immune system destroys the synovial joints. Here do you see this space here? Here is C1, here is C2. Look what's happening to the cord. That's points off if you do that. Okay, so the cord is being really compressed here. That's because the synovitis of the C12 joint eroded what ligament? The transverse ligament. And now this patient's got instability. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we have to get flexion extension x-rays to see if they can be intubated or not. So you have to remember these things. And then finally, neuropathic pain. Nerve damage, pain signals, relentless, becomes amplified. Burning, twitching, crushing, gnawing, crawling pain, hypersensitivity, and as I like to say, rock in the sock. Neuropathic pain can be worse at night, but can be affected by activity. So if you have a positive straight leg raise, doesn't rule out neuropathic pain. And allodynia, as we talked about, chain generated from innocuous stimulation, touch oppression common. And then I lied to you, we're gonna do one more. Peripheral neuropathy. It's a fiber length dependent injury, meaning the longest nerves in the body are affected first. So where are the longest nerves in the body? Feet, yeah. So since the S1 nerve originates here and has to go all the way down there, that's the longest part of the body. So what's going to be affected first? Toes. So people start with bilaterally symmetrical toe paresthesias numbness. They hate covers. They don't like socks. A lot of the times if it gets bad enough, they will want baggy shoes that don't put any pressure on them. And by the, t so this is an ascending numbness. So the symptoms start in the feet and come up the leg. Once, remember it's fiber length dependent. Once it gets to the knees, the fingertips start to become involved. And once it gets up to the thigh, you have the entire hand involved. So this is a common progression for patients. And there's also metabolic peripheral neuropathies. Hypothyroidism can cause carpal tunnel syndrome. B12 deficiency, as we talked about, alcoholism, diabetes, all of these can cause a neuropathy. So you have to ask these questions. And then I lie to you again, because now we have CRPS or RSD, complex regional pain syndrome. What we think happens here, some type of trauma, surgery, infection, injury, and the sympathetic nervous system somehow connects to the somatic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system triggers and all of a sudden it's sending messages into the pain receptors. And so it's this reverberating circuit of misery. This is a common presentation for RSD or CRPS. You get swollen feet, you get contraction of the tendons, and eventually it burns out and turns red and raw. These people don't want you to come close to their legs. If whatever leg is involved, whatever arm is involved, they're pretty miserable. Again, six months after the onset, swelling disappears, extremity is cool and pale with contracted joints, nails brittle, and continued pain. We'll talk about how to treat this. There's no cure for it. And then I lie to you again. Sorry, but we have to talk about myopathies. So it's a primary disorder of the skeletal muscle, commonly caused weakness, cramping, and myoglobinuria, that's a lab finding on a blood test, obviously. Proximal weakness, typically. So upper extremity, shoulders, lower extremity, pelvis. Difficulty rising from a chair, can't climb stairs, can't work with arms overhead. Symmetric, typically. Polymyositis, has muscle pain and tenderness. There's polymyalgia rheumatica. 
and the treatment for most of these are steroids. And then finally, I'll keep lying to you because <laughs> I have fibromyalgia. So this is a disease process that has no laboratory tests. So some people don't believe it because you can't do anything, EMGs, NCVs, blood tests, even physical exam. The only thing you have are painful points in four quadrants, and these people are probably also depressed and have mechanical case of pain. This is a very tough disorder to treat. And then, I lied to you once again, medical legal con considerations. There are some people that get into auto accidents and the more pain they have, the more they benefit from their disability. So if they don't want to go to work and they get into an auto accident or a work comp injury, what are they going to do? They're going to extend their illness. And it's not necessarily malingering. Malingering is a conscious reason to do this. I'm going to screw the system. These people aren't. They subconsciously, they're trying to figure out what's going on, but they don't necessarily have the need to get better. If they're off of work, it's better than having to go to work and being miserable. So you have to be careful about secondary gain. And some people lose their desire and accountability for rehab. And if it's a conscious effort to subterfuge and imaginary pain, that's malingering. I can tell you at the university when I was there, probably I only saw about 3% malingering. In Detroit, I saw 10%. In Denver, I saw 3%. Here, it's incredibly rare to see malingering. I mean, I don't know if I've seen more than one or two patients in 20,000. So it's rare to look for, but you have to think about it. And now, lunchtime.